Greetings of peace and love and welcome once again back onto Divani Ishk for our monthly um, live penning and session. Today, what we had um, or what we have in mind is um, the topic of resilience and considering there's so much going on. Um, there's so much inspiration to take from um, that this topic is uh, extremely necessary to just go over in a very non-formal way or informal way. And this is what we're going to be doing. Uh, Louise is going to be a bit silent for today's divan. But uh, what we'd like is um, sort of like a collective uh, uh, you know uh, participation from all uh, there's nothing really to say except for that you know we're going to talk about this topic and just uh, pen and also understand what that means to us as opposed to any sort of um, um, particular models to explain the topic I encourage um, everyone to unmute and speak whenever you feel, um, you know, when we're discussing to just kind of uh, very casually just enter into the room, into the discussion and and, and share. Um, we could look at it as a collective sohbah. Now, basically, we want to go over... Um, basically a textbook definition of what resilience means and then take it from there. Resilience is the ability to adapt and recover quickly from difficulties, adversities, or significant sources of stress. It involves bouncing back from setbacks and maintaining mental well-being despite challenges. Resilience is not about avoiding stress or hardships, but rather about being able to cope with them effectively and emerge stronger. There are different examples of resilience. We have personal resilience, and that could go anywhere from emotional recovery after an episode, i.e. a breakup, a loss, uh, death, separation, um, and so forth. And to basically regain a sense of emotional stability after an episode, after a situation. Um, health challenges. So in, in, in the case of health challenges, what is the resilience involved in that? It varies from person to person. Then we have community resilience, we have organizational resilience, and, and then we have environmental resilience. Um, but for today, for example, we want to go more into personal and collective. And since we cannot really speak on behalf of the collective, we can speak you know, in terms of, or in respect to the individual ourselves. And that's what we're going to be doing. So we want to open up the floor and just maybe without any sort of deep thought, just share what resilience, what comes to mind when this word basically comes up. You can unmute and say... Assalamu alaikum. Um, for me, the first thing that uh, 
I think about is when I learned their words. I remember I was running with, I was uh, in university and I was running with a team. And then I, and we were, I, we were doing boot camp. And then uh, actually that was another word. But I don't know why I just thought of that, Mary. It was tenacious. And I don't know if tenacious has to do with resilience. But um, I thought about that, but I don't know why I thought about it. It was just the idea of uh, keep going, like, fall, you know, falling. And I, um, it just feels like, uh, subhanAllah, like there's always something after the other, you know, any... Allah doesn't stop with the, with the, yeah, and you, eventually you have to sit with, with, with things because Allah's just going to give you a slap after the other, <laughs> you know? Um, so I feel for me, resilience uh, has to do with uh, showing up regardless of what you're, what you're going through, like always showing up. And um that's it like and having a consistent practice where you give to yourself so you can give to the world you have to have that or else you, there's no resilience if you're not having that uh, replenishing for your soul and your body and your spirit so you can really show, show up and and, and uh, hold up values that, Resonates. That resonates. What came to mind for me, um, or heart combination, is um, resilience after um being challenged with the health related or, you know, something in regards to your health and how you come out of that or how you deal with it um, during. And a simple things, you know, simple example of that would be like, you know, how, you know, you get a flu. And I think women in general, um, having a lot on their plate um, they don't always get the luxury to have the downtime and perhaps we by nature are more resilient um, and 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 in relation to you know just getting back even if you're not fully recovered we have a tendency to somehow manage and get back on track. Um, what came to mind was I have um, a close friend and um, she's a very well-known personality and in Canada. And she she's about, she's about a year younger than me. And um, she made her, uh, like she went public about her health and so she had two types of cancers that she was dealing with. And um, she's an activist and, you know, a believer in whatever she believes in. Um, but going through that and, 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 and basically, you know, being so vulnerable that her, her entire health journey became like a, um it was it was out there in the public and going through all her challenges gave me like such a deep sort of reverence for her resilience because i mean technically you know there was no there was no guarantee and and, and the doctors had already given you know all sorts of statements regarding her health but she was so resilient, I think, definitely in mind uh, and in spirit that she's come out now um, so much stronger and she's beat her cancer. 
um, so that that gave me sort of uh, you know that, that that's what came to mind and you can tell a lot about a person's ability to be resilient with the day-to-day -day sort of mishaps that happen to us physically or if we're if we have a simple cold or something bigger and how we uh, I guess cope with it and how we come out of it and deal with it um, are we emotionally stronger or not tells a lot about us so health yeah Do we have anyone else who would like to share, um, you know, what comes to mind? What um, what is it that comes to mind when something right now, which is so um, right in our in our consciousness, and that is the case of Palestine? What sort of um, feelings do we get when we think of resilience and the Palestinians? I, I think uh, <clears throat> the Palestinians literally epitomized the word resilience because I was just reading this post yesterday and they said that they, the, the city Gaza has been attacked several times and there was this spot that was built 200 to 600 times. So the there's just no stopping to them. Uh, and yesterday there was also this picture shared of a woman. She was, there was this bomb blast and she was just carrying all the water buckets for her children. And, you know, there's everything is crumbled and they're just still trying to celebrate their little baby's birthday. So... Yeah, I mean, even if we in our mundane, simple life lose hope over little things, we see Palestinians literally standing as with integrity and all the internal strength <laughs> and doing what they're doing. Yeah, so they're there, yes, they there's always, literally these days, I take a lot from them. I mean, they're exemplary in their resilience because, 100%. you know, you could, you could, you could basically measure resilience um, over time. So we're looking at, you know, over seven decades worth of yes. resilience and it's unstoppable and it's remarkable. It's beyond like human, the normal human capacity. So the question is what makes a people or person resilient? What comes to mind? <laughs> we're not looking at research. We're looking at just like, what is it that, you know, we're just kind of exploring the topic as non-experts, as just human beings. This is what the space is about. Nobody here claims to be an expert in anything. It's just... You know, we want to just be, um, yeah, just have this discussion. Um, what, one makes, thing, what makes them? Yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, um, one thing that comes to mind is knowing that at the end um, that you will have victory, that Allah promised them victory. And 
holding on to that. And uh, Allah loves those who don't give up. So it's no reason to give up knowing that you have victory. And there's, there's this thing when we're challenged, like when we're just in the funk, then, you know, we fall. But when we're challenged, when someone is ch challenging us, it almost like um, the fire in us gets like um, waved and it's just like, oh, like you're, ch you're trying to, you you think less of me or you think I don't deserve to live in this land. You think I don't have the right to human rights. And so with that challenge, it's like, what makes me not have basic human rights? And then, you know, they go back to the Quran and then they have the elders because a lot of the young ones, mashallah, the way they speak, you can hear um, their ancestors in their voice. So, you know, being challenged and knowing that at the end, when it's time, you know, that they will have victory. That's powerful. Hearing the ancestors in their voice, something to think about. Even when children are interviewed, their emotional resilience is just um, such a deep eye opener. Um, what came to mind was necessity, like being uh, in a situation where you have to be resilient, like you, you don't have a choice. Um, and then it's so true in uh, like um, you're taught, and you we're taught, and even the grandkids, even even if even if we're inside of Palestine or outside of Palestine, like the grandkids feel a a connection to the to the land of Palestine, like how is uh how is this happening? You know, like this it, I, I feel like it's almost uh, um fitra, our fitra to be to just be, you know, um again not as Palestinians, as people and now when something is wrong you're just no, you know, like no. And then we have the example of the Palestinian people and we're like, oh if they're dying for it. How can't we just, you know, just speak or how can we turn a blind eye? And I think there's uh, sometimes it's like uh, not standing up for yourself. It like almost standing up for someone else makes you more resilient than standing up for yourself. You know, and Annie, um, and if you see if somebody beats you down, yeah, you you could be you could you could let them beat you down. But if you see your son or your brother or your father be beaten down it's very different like you, you something in you just you know is uh, just yeah provoked yeah mm. that that just reminded me about uh you know the incidents of the um how the Quraysh would treat the prophet peace be upon him in um you know, while he would pray, they would um, place uh, the intestines of the camel, for example, upon the prophet, peace be upon him. And who was it every time who would remove? The resilient one, Fatima al-Zahra. Um, yet, Yet she was so graceful and she never really, I mean, she like it was known that she overlooked her own needs. But when it came to 
uh, seeing something happening that was unjust. Um, so she, that, that, you know, that you saw within her. Um, what comes to mind also is like, what makes, what are the factors that make people resilient? Um, what marks the difference? What are these factors? So if we could just like, you know, go around and, and say one word that comes to mind. Thinking of individuals like, I don't know, Malcolm X, Nelson Mandela, you have uh, Gandhi, you have early, um, you know, the early Muslims uh, who were per persecuted. Um, people of today and yesterday, nations. So, um, what 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 is it that makes individuals so resilient? You said necessity, and I think that's that's very key. But what else is it that makes people so resilient? What are the factors? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Sometimes you don't have a choice. I think we did circle around that. When you don't have a choice, okay, I got beat down. Okay, the house is gone. Everything is gone, but I'm still living. And through that, sometimes there's like this positive, like we've been here before, you know, we're going to rebuild it. We, re we re rebuild it better then something inside you is you're not gonna, well, you can't kill my spirit. Yes, you can get rid of all this. And, and I love my loved ones and they're martyrs and I miss them, but you can't kill our spirit. And it just keeps, then it makes you stronger through time. So many times of just like sleeping, getting up. Okay, I'm hungry, but, and then you're doing it again, but we're gonna stand tall. You know, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, that's that's very true. So basically, like um, a repetitive exposure to hardship, right? This is an everyday sort of um, scenario. But not and everyone reacts the same way that you know everything. Uh, they are not. There are those who, uh, who don't want to live in that same condition, and there are some who become resilient, and there are some who just wish that. So we have both sides. We just can't say that. We, uh, you know, uh, under boiling pressure, we have the lead just you know burst open, where whereas you know the the potatoes get mashed or and. Other on in other instances under a lot of pressure there we have diamonds and we have the hard boiled eggs but so it's different that uh, the necessity of uh, torment and all of that does not always bring res brings resilience but the repetition is not the factor I think it's the vision which with with which people carry themselves that okay they are not doing for themselves they are doing for a greater cause that is going to create the ripple effect so we have the uh, so yes the i think vision is necessary to help because they say that you know the one who plants the tree does not plant for herself or himself but he plants for the coming generation so resilience there is there that is where the momentum for resilience is set And then I'm reminded of 
very powerful quote of, of Palestinian quote. They said, we don't want our revolution to be like the Blacks' revolution. I mean, I'm not creating a disparity, but they 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 held it on with certain integration, uh, integrity and not stepping back. So uh, there was this line, that they, they said that we are not, our cause is not like those of, uh, like the Black movement or the other movement. Ours is um, is a consistent fight back and there has never been a stepping back from it. So inshallah, I'll find that quote, but that was so powerful. There, there's never a moment in the history that there has been um, that they shed off their struggle. It has continued consistently. It resonates what you said, vision and uh, consistency are very important, like to have a vision and uh, courage, to have courage, to be honest, to be able to speak truth to people who are more powerful than you and not to be. So that takes courage because, you, you know. Yeah. Um, I also brought responsibility of it. And I, I don't know, I've been thinking a lot about ego and like having a collective ego you know yani the ego's there and i know we try to try and battle our ego but then there's also like the and i don't know what you think about think, think about it like the what it means to have a collective ego and i feel that is part of the resilience because i feel like to be resilient you need to uh it's not egotistical, but you have to know what's your, yeah, I mean, it's like, it's still like, um, um, it's enough. I don't know if, if I'm, if I'm saying something wrong, I don't know. It just feels like you're not letting go of something. You're holding on to something, but it's not yours. It's a collective. You know? It's almost like an attachment to a greater vision or a cause an attachment, right? Because if you're not attached, then you don't care. And if you don't care, you're just going to, you're not, there's nothing that would bother you to act in a certain way. I mean, even, um, even the resilience of um, the Central Asians, like, I mean, more specifically, Bukhara and, and Samarkand and Uzbekistan during the communist period, so for decades, um, they weren't allowed to practice religion. Uh, all their madarises were shut down, mas masajids were shut down, and they had their secret sort of uh, Quran, tr passing the Quran on to the next generation by grandmothers and so forth. Um, the teaching and learning, um, they really were resilient people as well, but they're they're out of that now because communism is basically it's it's not directly impacting them anymore um and they've come out um with a strong sense of identity so much so that they go to lengths to preserve culture tradition their heritage their food um or cuisine and 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 so so on so forth so yeah it's almost like um uh when you talk about the collective you said collective what collective yeah i mean yeah it's almost like um there's the there's there's a factoring in of like people who have gone through trauma collectively, or if not, you know, individually, um, and it's usually collectively, even if it's with a specific ethnic group or or race. Um, look at the um, the Africans, the the Afro Americans, right? 
Look at how resilient they are. And they're so much more aware so that history does not repeat. I think trauma um, is a major factor in, um, in, in making individuals or people resilient. And, and um, people bond more together when they face the same trauma. You know, Yanni, it's, we resonate, we we resonate. Like there is this, uh, you know, when you work with someone and they, and you're working on really hard things and sensitive topics and things, you build a, a like a more intimate relationship with them because you're facing really like the nakedness of, of human human beings, like how fragile we are. So that bonding is very um, important also for resilience. Community is very important. Without a doubt. Um... You see a lot of artists um, globally, especially Palestinian artists um, or diaspora, basically. And, um, you know, the resilience is very, um, very clearly seen in how they um, continue to pass on the message through their art forms. And, uh, bringing awareness out. Is there, um, is there a time that you went through something that you've never experienced before and um, something that felt more than you could handle and and then made you stronger after the fact. Is there something that we could uh, possibly pen on in this regard? Because we're talking about resilience, right? So on a personal level, um, because I'm gonna, I'm just gonna repeat once again, the um, the definition here. Resilience is the ability to adapt and recover quickly from difficulties, adversities, or significant sources of stress. It involves bouncing back from setbacks and maintaining mental well-being despite challenges. Resilience is not about avoiding stress or hardships, but rather about being able to cope. So cope is the key word with them effectively and emerge stronger. So perhaps we can take a few moments um, and reflect about something possibly recent, if not further back. Uh, if that's what's required, and um, connect to the resilience um, that we experienced through going through a specific situation as a reminder to ourselves.
Okay, so do we have um, anybody who'd like to share? Father is our first love, and God renders me fatherless. Every once in a while, when my femininity obliges to spread her wings, cross borders, be in na her nature, anyone who has clipped them, I have recovered. But the cage of the silent, dismissive father has given me pain as well as faith. Loving without needing, continuing to give without expectation, feeling the hurt of the echoing room, and the back that is the reply to every salam, and persisting to say salam. And remembering that we are here for rising to the cause of rights and not of patriarchal norms. Spreading my wings regardless to give shade to my heart that holds more than my family, but ultimately wishes to serve humanity. May all birds flee their nests or any mental cages of generational expectation, which serve us no more. Did you say mental cages? Yes, I did. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mehtab, no more. I have random um, writing, um, and I did ask AI about resilience. <laughs> I'm just gonna run mm. To breathe the God-given right to achieve, unbreakable, the unbreakable thread that continually repairs and strengthens itself, Testing that which is resilient and determination. You can't break something that is intangible, a muscle of the unseen that is unseen, that breaks and comes back stronger. When I first lived out of bags, the bags were heavy. After the 11th relocation, the bags became lighter. I forgot I was living out of bags because I was the only one living it. And the continued psych of bag living became the norm till I wanted better for myself. And I saw a vision of living a better norm. Not sure what it is forcing coming out and what it is wanting to flow. Res resilience in this writing to be human, imperfect to strip away things, to be okay being right, wrong, and indifferent, indifferent.
I have I have other things, but it's I could barely understand my handwriting and it's a lot. <laughs> if you feel inspired, feel free. We're here to um take in whatever is being transmitted. <clears throat> Coping resilient so much so that you learn to cope with the feeling. When I see the Palestinians, when you have no choice, when God wakes you up the next day, when you see some, some that you loved who are surviving with you and the hints of laughter, hey, we are still here. They think so important of us to do all this and we are still here. We are simple people, and they are the biggest army, worried about little all us. How do we cope with these things? The positive outcome that is saying over and over again, victory is ours. Victory belongs to God. We are with God. God is with us. He instills in us, and we go back to the Quran, back to the remembrance of the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum. We are a part of a resilient ummah. We stand up for justice. We feed each other. Resilient when that you resilient knowing you deserve better and the vision there that there is better. How many times did we pick up bags? How many times did you not have a home nor a place to sleep? Resilient in being human, being someone, being something. The soul never dies. The soul is a part of the source. The nef suffers. The well is there by his permission, his command to unleash. Collective ego. Am I resilient? I have resiliency. I wouldn't say I'm resilient. I have died, I have gotten up and tried again and again. The resiliency, resilient, our resilience, I, we, who, we don't back down, we can't back down. Can't go down without a fight. This is our life we're talking about. This is the God-given right. I'm connecting deeper um, with your um, mention of the spirit never dies. I think there's a secret in that connected to resilience. Thank you. Mehtab, would you like to share something? When I know my why, I rose up to speak my truth unstoppable with the ferocity of a tiger. Too many stabs and hisses, yet I maintain my farm. Fourteen years crunched into and a half. Now I'm back again into pieces more than one and then there's the other that is imagination creates vision vision expands horizon some get a peak beyond the illusion of pain while some brought running out of patience the clouds don't go away the sun of light, the sun of life shines differently on some while the sun remains the same.
So does that mean that the people near the equator are lucky? Maybe. Or those in the north, unfortunate <laughs> to be Maybe. deprived of sun? Yeah, basically, uh, we should ask the sun. Mm -hmm. The sun's like, I'm just me. Thank you. What do I have here? I wonder at the mother who thanks the heavens for the death of her children. At her witnessing their death, she still smiles. Trusts in the cre creator's will even as a victim, she did not renegade or complain. How do we wake up the next day? How does she pray as if nothing happened? Resilience. Is it a matter of survival when the body suddenly surprises you and says no more? Is it a death warning or a mercy? to know something is viciously wrong and if left uncared for, neglected, the spiral downwards is not a choice. Do we fight for life? Inherently so, or give up? Mental resilience is the start, the energy that gives life to endure the struggle and come out better. Is it our nature to fight, to keep life force alive? A desire to stay alive? The pain in seeing a loved one deteriorate before our very eyes, their state of helplessness, we pray for them. Is that an act of resilience, the prayer itself? a desire for others to live equally. Can't, I can't seem to see what, what, I can't seem to read that line. To restore and to live. Is it through the pain body, the cracks, the broken heartedness, where light enters, the sickness is the cure. We migrate from old ways to new, only not, only so to not relive the old. We change what is necessary to stay emotionally and physically resilient or healthy. No body desires to relive trauma. So, is it our pain body that pushes us into resilience to avoid the pain, to avoid pain, to avoid death? Albeit being surrounded by dead bodies, what is left after homes have been demolished, burnt, and our people massacred? There is nothing to live for in an open air prison. Why then the resilience when no rainbow shines, no sun after rain? Is it the spirit's essence of being eternal, the life force of the most resilient ones, reminding us of eternal strength, which comes not from our body or the external, but the eternal spirit, which, mir which mirrors the resilience, which fuels the resilience of the resilient ones. It's just something I'm questioning. Where does that come from? I am complete.
So I think that basically comes to a somewhat closing of our um, our space here because we're losing um, we're losing the sort of flow in <laughs> uh, continued talk. And it is what it is. So um, perhaps we should um, close off. I think it's just a very deep topic. And it's almost like theoretically can be spoken about to some degree experience. But then when you not necessarily compare, but when you look at what people um, who are going through real struggles, it's hard to even bring forth an experience um, of our personal resilience uh, just due to the um, due to the due to the sort of um, how you would measure um, what is resilience. Um, is it even something worthy? Not worthy, but is it something um, that we could claim resilience in comparison to those who are actually embodying that? So, yeah. I wanted to give an example right now. My there's a fly in here and my cat is chasing it and she is not giving up without a fight and she is continuously like you know um hiding and um like looking like she's her back legs is like um she's tooting a horse or something. And it's just when you want something so bad, you want it and you become resilient wanting it. And you just want it. You're going for it until you get it because now this is all that you want. You just want the fly. Or you just want to fly. Yeah. Wow, better. Yeah. And I feel kind of any of what I was sharing is like whenever you know, I can't compare myself to what the Palestinians are going through in Gaza or Rafah or all the territories of Iran. Every every so often, I yani, and even when I started being in Tariqa and doing, maybe I was, my nafs was shway extreme, yani, so I wasn't really paying attention to my surroundings and things. So it always feels like whenever my, like the silent treatment of my father, it's just something, it's just so hard when you, when you, when you love someone and you want someone to love you back, or you just expect them like they're your parents, you know, and you go and you want to hug them and they turn away. And it just, it also takes a lot of resilience to wake up to to keep giving. And yani before I I used to just ignore. Now it's just like, Baba, our time is is yani, it's passing, you know. And then, and yeah, like I'm gonna share more. Sorry, I I know you said you wanted to be. be we we're gonna close. No, no, we don't have to. It's if it's naturally coming, I we should continue. There's more openings. So next next week I'm I'm going to yani of course my friends yani my Allah she she I I I go her death I felt like I should be going back to to see my other friends there because everyone's struggling you know everyone's struggling and they're on their own and everyone's resilient in a way because. Yani anyway, they're just going through so much and yeah like just being in such a 
vulnerable situation to 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 blow her head off like I, I, I still can't imagine like what's the situation you know what's what's the I, I just felt she pulled that I have to be there so I I booked my flight without really thinking about it and then my father's like you're going to the enemy you're going to America and you know American people these are my friends and I lived there for seven years and you sent me here I don't get it you know and then you just stopped talking to me and I was like and, he, and I and and it's it's so and I can't just and it's his way of making me not go you know like don't don't talk to me until you change your mind and I'm like that Yanni I have to go and sometimes resilience is that you know you have to have you it's sacrifice also you know it's it's sacrifice you sacrifice yeah, you realize the the resilience can be actually activated when you um when you when you're um when the roadblocks come, right? When you have resistance in something you want to do. So you have people in your life who are cheerleaders and then those who are like massive critics, right? But then does do these supposed negative factors um, determine our resilience or just give us a reflection of our own reality? Like today I was in, a, I, I went to this uh, healing session thing, right? They, there's a circle that, that is kept once a month for women. And there was a lady saying that um, I will not do anything unless I get my family on board. And if they're not happy, I'm not going to do it. And most of us were like confused. We're like, okay, so if they don't get on board and you're passionate about something just because they don't get you or they're not interested or they don't validate or see the importance, are you just going to give that up? And most of the women were like, it's, it's, it's more, I mean, to, to live a life without like doing what you need to, irrespective of the resistance you get and knowing that you didn't try is just the scariest thing uh living a whole life without you know making that effort so yeah in regards to what you said about your father or people in other cases where there's um you you see the lioness within you come forth actually more um because you reassess your values and your your value is clear right you want to be there for i what are your reasons, for example, for going there to the States at this time? Maybe that's what something you can tell us. Why didn't you cancel your ticket? Um, I want to be there for my friends. I want to understand what's going on. Like that led her to do that. Like just fragil fragility. I also feel like it's just the timing, what's happening with the U.S. It's, it's very... Uh, Yani, there's a lot of work for Palestine also being done. But I felt like I want to be there. Yani, there are many reasons pulling me and just the timing. I'm not going to go and just protest, but I feel like I want to be there where where there's a people are speaking out and there's truth and there's co coalitions being built, all allyships, all of that. And I want and I felt like women really need women. Yani, especially feeling like my friend, all of them struggled with mental health and I struggled with mental health. But I feel it's more than that. It's like us not having each other in spirit, you know, like not holding on to holding on. And I, and I, and I, and I feel like I've been attaching to my family and stuff, not holding on to the rope really alone. You know, Yani, Yani, I understand family is important, but me being here is just me. Uh, conforming to what what's been what's what's expected of me it's not like a twakkal ala Allah and I and I be where I feel pulled to go you know that that's, that's, that's good for you we need we need uh we need me in the states you can team up with Noor <laughs> Noor meet up you guys should do the meet up me and Noor. Where are you going to be? 
in California for for two weeks. So, but I, inshallah, if Allah fetch me doors, I'm going to, back to Cali. I'm going, going back to Cali. Good, yeah. good. You say if Allah opens doors, you're gonna I, I, stay long. No, I'm gonna go, come back. But if I find a a job or a way to stay, I'm gonna uh, come back, pack up, and leave. Okay. Um, what part of California? Uh, north, the Sacramento. Okay, maybe. Uh, do you know where you're gonna be staying? This time, yeah, at my friend's. There. Okay. If you can, if I, mm -hmm. can you come? I mean, I can see about doing like two, three days, maybe two days. That, that would be lovely. Um, and I can stay with you and your friend. Uh, I'll ask her. Probably she has a lot of kids. I don't know how what her space is like, but we'll be in touch. Inshallah. I'll, okay. I'll, that would, oh, that would be lovely to see you, Sean. What What are your uh dates? Uh, next is June six. So June, yeah, June six till June twenty. Yes. Okay, June six to June twentieth. Okay, so I can aim towards your end of your trip so that you can do time with your friends, and then, inshallah, I'll try to aim. Between the 17th and the 19th. Inshallah. I'll be in touch with you, inshallah. Okay, inshallah. <laughs> Never know. <laughs> hey, inshallah. Um, alhamdulillah. Inshallah, let's see. That'll be nice. Um, um, you know, I was I was thinking about resilience and I was like, I think just, just it's in our nature right? The way we've been designed. Reason being is that we're finite in the sense that we, um, our bodies are, you know, they're not going to last forever, but it's the spirit. So, so then that's something to really make a connection with in terms of what is it that what is this resilience? Where is it coming from? It's coming from eternal source, right? It's coming from that which never dies, al hay, And that is what gives life to all. So, yeah, I, 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 I'm I, seeing a little bit more clarity or I'm feeling more clarity with, um, with that. But then I was also thinking about um, heartbreak, right? How how many people do we know including ourselves that you know you, you're, you're heartbroken you're like i'm never going to do this again i'm done and then a knock comes and then what happens <laughs> repeat right oh sorry i'm not muted <laughs> you're not <laughs> Good, I you're exposed. You. Good, because <laughs> you have this that guilt laugh. Like that. <laughs> yeah. So, so what is that? Because it's like you know the heart desires love, and you can't really stop that, can you? I mean, I guess people can if they become like full time stoics or whatever, but. Um, if you're in touch with the reality of the eternal, then why is it uh, why is it that you know you can pick up again after like the greatest tragic situation uh, your heart can go through? And how is it you can give it another chance? So that's another kind of resilience thing um, uh, characteristic. Um, I can't remember. I was gonna say something else, but it reminded me of Rumi when he says uh, he drinks from the bitter wine, like he doesn't drink from the sweet wine. You know, like mm -hmm. I don't know. 
that uh, it's really it, it puts you in a very desperate state and then you're not looking for humans anymore and you, you know it's like I feel like when you're when you're so broken and you keep breaking again you're giving yourself more to you're surrendering you know you're and who are you surrendering for you, that's the question like are you are you going back to or are you like you know when uh, when there's the the, the poem uh, I choose to love you in silence like that it gives you I don't know maybe it just makes you ho hold on to something more eternal than and than what's here true i think also for resilience to be embodied because we're we're on the path to becoming our true self right that's essentially what we desire to uh, we desire consciously or unconsciously and in the process having exemplaries are key and that's why like the Quran is continuously throughout um, there are stories of stories upon stories about resilience right you have you know the greatest uh, story that's mentioned in the quran is about uh, for example yusuf alayhi salam so after going through all that he did how does he come out of that right how does he come out of that storm uh, and we have uh, we have the exemplary, <clears throat> most beautiful example of the Prophet, peace be upon him, who who was born uh, as an orphan, right? And then he loses his mother, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He loses his grandfather. Um, he's adopted uh, continuously in different homes. Um, meaning from his grandfather to his uncle, and he loses his beloved ones. Um, there's so many tests uh, that are uh, set upon the Prophet, peace be upon him. So then a person going through trials, it, I, I think that, you know, when we have um, relatability, meaning individuals that we can look up to, um, it serves um, to give us strength. It does, because then we're reminded that we're not alone and that the greatest of people have gone through the greatest, greatest tests, the most unimaginable circumstances and how they came out and how they continued life and became a means of inspiring people and uh, just illuminating hearts. You have now Nelson Mandela as well, right? 27 years in prison. He rose to presidency. Um, yeah. So we do not have to be taking the narrative of victim but we could be victor, right? That's that's also a choice, and that is a paradigm, and that is a reflection of res resilience as well. Um, so exemplaries are important to study the lives of illuminaries um, from all people and historical and even present-day individuals serves as a great sort of... Um, way to remind ourselves and to be made aware yeah equally equip ourselves for the worst if that would befall us
Yes. Hmm. Um, yes, well, oh, your poem was all about, I thought I'm probably Ahlul Bayt. Um, I don't know how spirit can live within us, and I don't know how my dad works, but definitely to constantly remember. Um, yani, um, that they're all martyrs, and I mean, all 12, 12 birds are martyrs, and we're witnessing. And what does that mean? And what does what does um what, what do we have to do to be to hold to to say we love and then what do we do to embody but also empty ourselves from ourselves to also have that ruh come through us without um being stuck in our in, in what's the any dunya you know I, which is very hard. So, Allah medit inshallah. Amen. Mm. Yeah. Ironically, I mean, um, you mentioned the Ahlul Bayt. Ironically, of course, it's it's all one. But um, I was actually just zooming in um, into the Palestinians. But like I said, you know, or like we, I think we can all agree that. There is no duality in that, right? Um, it's all relatable. And um, I think we've mentioned it in the past in other platforms that um, the Ahlul Karbala are the Palestinians right now, like at least on, on the very obvious level, not to exclude others who are going through, uh, you know, uh, similar situations or genocide and so forth it's 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 all it's all there we take inspiration from them um, and even though like you know we have the safety of living in countries where we're not necessarily you know um you know fighting for our life in that same sense uh, just being witnesses to the atrocities should be giving us that, you know, sense of resilience to endure and to be able to go through, like, challenges that are nowhere close to what we are witnessing. Um, in a more graceful way um, and our um, our issues are nowhere comparable right so we become aware um, So we've had uh, a good amount of time on this call, and I'm sure we could probably continue and always have something to say, but let us um, conclude and um, with the intention to reflect further on this topic, and it will open up accordingly. If there's anything anybody would like to say in conclusion or any concluding comments or share anything, please unmute and do so. Um, I have a book with me called Sacred Activism by Dawood Wadid. Um, I just opened a page and um, 
and there's a hadith. Um, Abu Bakr, Bismillah. Abu Bakr Sadiq said, according to a sound narration in Sunan Abi Dawood, Sunan at Timidi, and Sunan Sa'i, O people, surely you recite this ayah, O you believe, take care of your own souls. No harm can come to you from one who is astray when you are guided aright. Surah Al Ma'idah. But surely I also heard the Prophet, a messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, saying, Surely people, when they see a wrongdoer and do not take him by the hand to attempt to stop his evil, Allah soon will punish all of them. And your supplication won't be accepted. So this is for all air patients, for all of us who are. So what is this book essentially about? Spiritual activism? Is that what you said? Or sacred activism? Sacred activism. Oh. And what, what is it that they're, um, or the author is emphasizing? Just curious. Um, and how do you participate uh, as Muslims? How do we participate in uh, forbid, uh, forbidding evil and and furthering goods and w with relation to the causes we care about without without uh, going into things against uh, sunnah and against uh, how do we and then how do we build allyships and who are our allies and who are a co and what's the difference between allies coalition and uh, it's a short book but it's it's just giving us and in uh it's it, Kind of guiding us, you know, we have to follow the, uh, yeah, I mean, the Quran, and then we join protest. We don't just join. Mm. No. Right. Yeah, that's something that uh, initially we talked about, right? And, um, but we uh, we talked about um, subtle activism, I believe, right? Was that one one back in September? Do you recall that? I remember us talking about joining. Some people spoke about protests, and some people said they wouldn't, and they're doing different. Was it that right? Time? Right. Actually, yeah. Um, I don't know, Noor, if you heard my message, right? But I was responding back to your message to say that um, even when, even if like Shuyu have said, for example, that uh, do not join the protests, I think it even requires a further interpretation of what they're saying and not literal. Um, and this is what marks the difference between um, taking a sohbah and just interpreting it as literal, because that's layman status, that's generally what happens. And then you have somebody who's authorized who can uh, be able to highlight what that poss possibly means. So I, I, in my personal opinion, which is going out in the public, and I don't care if I don't, like, I hardly ever care what anyone thinks anyways, <laughs> but like, um, I, I never felt, for for example, in the case of um, Maulana Sheikh Mahmoud, um, who, who had given instructions to not, because uh, a lot of students did ask about this on various platforms, and I never took it as literal. I think what how I understood it was, do not, just a second, So what I what I understood was that don't make that your only go to, right? So bringing in the subtle activism means, okay, continue with your prayers, continue with connecting and making an impact in various ways, but don't make that your everyday sort of sort of thing because some people could get maybe, um, drawn into that as the only thing so they get the high and then they go full low 
and and it just it's like a ping pong situation so that's how i took it not as a final sort of like do not go period because there were people who actually acted upon it and that's not what i would ever uh say uh because i don't really see any of the sohbas as a literal sort of thing it just is it's not that and um i'll give you like an example I think it was 2012, where um, during the time of Maulana Sheikh Nazim, uh, there was something that was happening. I think there was like a 2012 blackout or something. There was something happening on like a large scale that everyone talked about, the news, the media and everything, right? And I don't remember what it was about. I just absolutely have blanked out. But apparently there was like, it was almost like a, like everyone thought, okay, you know, there's no electricity and um, we're going to be out of power for a good amount of time. And there was a lot of that sort of anxiety uh, in the collective and people were going out buying stuff. So some of the sohbas of Maulana Sheikh Nazim was about go get your water, go get your um, you know, staples, stock up on this and that. I don't even remember because I never used to read the sohbas, even though I was, you know, I was connected to him, but through the, <laughs> through the Rabita, I never read the sohbas of Sheikh Nazim. Okay, and that's just that's just the way I connected to him. It was never about that. What sohba, what he's transmitting to me day to day in my heart, that's what I would follow. So I had this best friend here in Jeddah and she was a literalist, right? She just joined, she got excited, and she thought she was on top of the game, you know, of sohba, hood, trying to like follow everything to the T, and she thought she was all cool about it. And I was like, hey, how, how come I don't even understand what you're doing? She's like, you, you don't know, Alicia, like, you know, you're supposed to get the water. I'm going now, I'm going to go get this and that, and my fool and my beans and whatnot. And and the days were coming near, apparently, to that date, whatever it was, December 12th or something like that. And and I didn't get one thing. And there were people stocking up, right? Whether they were, you know, students of Maulana or they were just normal people, the grocery stores were getting empty. And I was getting no instruction in my heart about this matter, even though clearly on the sohba, the literal ones, it was saying, go do that. So I'm following now what my heart is telling me, and it's not telling me that at all. So I could be potentially risking it, right? But I never felt that. And the day came, the day went, nothing happened. And she had like a whole storage room full of stuff. And I don't know what happened after that. So that was for me a confirmation continue to follow the heart because the shuyuks even test through their sohba, which are not always supposed to be taken in the literal sense. And that's that's just how it is for me. So the lesson here is check in <laughs> before following something literally. Check in with those who um, you can check in with, okay, without going further into it um, because then you could be really getting too literal and and get getting disappointed you know there was another sister i knew i think may knows her too and she apparently connected with uh you know some people and they said to her don't uh don't do yoga anymore so may told me about this and i said do yoga do yoga make sure you do yoga and and I was very open in my contradictory um, opinion against like this major sheikh. And, you know, I have a good connection with the sheikh. So I'm literally like contradicting him openly, but unapologetically and very like chill. Like I was like, yeah, you make sure you do yoga because <laughs> that's going to help you in your prayers. And that's what we women need. Like do not give up yoga. And uh, this friend said, no, 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 I have to follow the sheikh. I'm going to do yoga. I'm going to do yoga because I could be following my ego. And I said, okay, okay, fine. You want to do that? By all means, you do that. And then that led to a sudden, you know, like 
hitting the brick wall. And she's like, but I love yoga. Why did I stop? And it just created this rebellious, not rebellious, but this like, you know, loss of, um, loss of intuition, right? And that's not what the path is supposed to do. It's supposed to make you intuitive. And the real guides never micromanage. And yeah, so that that was it. So like you said, women need women. When we have, um, I think within our uh, sisterhood, sisters who are authorized, just trust me, check in with them before you start full 100% worshiping what they're saying, because they're not saying it in the way that we're interpreting it, number one. So it's giving too much power away, and it's going to wreck us. So just saying, you want to get wrecked, follow everything literally. You don't want to get wrecked, check in with with rebels like myself and maybe others. I wish Sheikh Umm al was around. She was, a, she was a hardcore rebel. You see, I posted her photo on my private Instagram. Did you see her? Yes, mashallah. She She's is so the majestic. boss. She's right there, straight out of Sudan. And she's a Sharifa from Mecca originally. She was like, she is a powerhouse. I don't know where she is right now. She she had to disappear because <laughs> she's like, you, you got to go do your stuff. I already told you everything you have to do. This is not a babysitting club, silver spoon feeding. I gave you the instructions, just go. And her deal was, she said that um, the way say that Zainab gives madad is when the more people you plug them into her, like the more people you the more awareness you bring about her to people, to heart, to women, and, and just connecting people to that wonderful, beautiful living guide, you will see how much support, spiritual support, we're talking about spiritual support, so you get the spiritual support. It's, it's almost like she said, this is like a, this is like, this is how it works. It's not keeping individuals for yourself, in your pocket, you know, you got this jewel and you're going to keep that safe and quiet. And I won't tell others because you're in a competitive mindset. No, you make sure you, you do the thicker openly and secretly, and that's, you'll be supported. So this opening for say the Zainab, by the way, came through a male guide, you know, Molana Sheikh Nazim. So what is that telling us? that they are saying, woman, oh, woman, go to the woman. We are opening this door for you. This was not open to anybody in the tariqa. It, it, it came through Ummul uh, Mu'minin, and she opened that up for me. And I'm carrying it from that time, and I'm sharing it openly. So good luck. Good luck on the literal parts, because it's, it's not good. It's not good for our feminine growth. And they're gonna watch this, and I don't mind. They know I'm like crazy, anyways, and they don't they don't have any issue with that. I give them all the updates. I show them the pictures that I'm taking with men, <laughs> and they don't mind. Yeah, I mean, not it's men like minded. generally, but like people of you know meet and greet yeah, situations. Same. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's not it's not what it is, and I'm just saying it just out of like real concern. <clears throat> because um, we do need to support one another. We need that support as sisters. And uh, we're not supposed to really try to tread the path alone, right? Any comments? <laughs> Feel free to say anything. Another sister, okay, I'll give you an, another example. Another sister uh, was sent by a, sh a sheikh, right? In the Naqshbandis, he said, you know, you're going to deal with Alicia. We want you to just stay under her 
care, whatever it was, whatever terms he used. So, okay, I don't know the sister, but I'm following and I'm dealing with her. And then she tells me that I'm pregnant. And uh, it says in the sohbahs of Maulana Sheikh Nazim, do not go for an ultrasound. I said, she goes, I and my husband decided we're not going for an ultrasound. And they think they're going to care. They're going to just have a great time in their country where it's like mandatory to do this. Right. So first of all, don't try to interpret the sohbahs because you definitely are getting it wrong. Secondly, that statement is accurate in the sense that, yes, he did say it. And Maulana Sheikh Nazim was very holistic. You have so many um, mentions of, you know, like, you know, the sunnah eating and lifestyle and all this advice that he gave. But him mentioning that was not to say no ultrasound period you know, go against the system, become an outcast, don't have anyone at your birth to help you. So then you get, you know, you have problems, right? That's not what he meant. He's basically saying limit intervention. So she still didn't listen to me. She was listening to a male sheikh who's never been pregnant, <laughs> right? And if he hears this, good. It's okay. Because I'm saying it out of love. The male sheikhs have not been pregnant <laughs> And they cannot understand it in the same light, right? Unless it's like, you know, they usually don't try to, they, they redirect you to, you know, maybe talk to your doctor or a specialist in the field. So they don't usually try to get into these topics. But in any way, she said, no, 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 I must follow. I must follow. He's telling me don't take the ultrasound. So she's now going, trying to find a doctor and she's in her fifth month or so. No doctor wants to see her without that. So what happens at the end? I, I told her she should go take it, but don't take the second one because that's not mandatory. And uh, she'll just make it difficult for herself. So at the end, she ended up having to take that ultrasound if she wanted a doctor. And that country does not have doulas or midwives. So she ended up having to take it. And and then I don't know if she learned her lesson, <laughs> but you know, that's, that's what happens. That's the little glitches you'll face if you deal with female matters to men. And the Rikha is not about, you know, going and saying, can I tie my lace this way? Do I do crisscross or do I do straight? Do I wear converse or tree torns or whatever? It's not about that. It's really not about that. If we, Rabita is to bring you back into intuition, to listening to your heart, and also acknowledging that the guides are channeling to your heart, but essentially it's like going back to your heart, right? It's going back to your heart. And it's not about seeking the external for everything. It's not about that. That's not the point of Tariha. There are people literally living like this, and they've lost all sense of. Uh, all their brain cells have been wiped out. <laughs> their intuition is gone. Yes. I don't know. It, it disappeared into some ozone layer. They have no intuition left and they think they're spiritual. Um, they're not able to have any opinions left in life. There's nothing original about them. So then they're not on the spiritual path. They're on some other path. I'm not sure. It's a doomsday cult. So just be careful. That's that's all I'm saying. And I'm just speaking from experience because, you know, I, I have been lured into the in the past, not with the Tariha cults, but just religiosity as being a cult in itself. So I, I would say we need to be careful. I'm not saying follow your nafs just because you're in love with that guy. You got to chase him down. But you can try, actually. By all means, you should try until you know. Right, me? <laughs> um, what you said is so important, and um, to chase the guy. No, I'm joking. <laughs> we're not joking. You know, we're not. <laughs> no, uh, but uh, like also, you know, Yanni, connecting with our ancestors is so important. Yanni, we we all have uh places where we we come from and places where yani 
we can't just remove ourselves and just say i'm gonna follow this blindly like i thought our experiences and why we are in the places we're in and why we feel certain ways and yani i had my my friend my childhood friend wears the hijab she was in a we were both in a yani westernly educated or she oh she wears the hijab i have nothing wrong with the hijab i used to wear the hijab but there's also a lot and I, and and i understand in in general in the religious sense we no touching between man and female we yani there are these things preserve your energy to me but but then for my experience that made me i don't know like i feel like i i yani not every touch with a man has to be sexual like from my experience i i i felt that i went through it i i i i danced with men i did all of these things i so i can't like what when when i have a friend and that i feel like i want to hug him i stop that you know and uh, it's like it's like i understand and i don't know if it's my nefs this is a question but yani when my heart is telling me something and then i he listen to my heart after or wanna exp- that's more of a real experience than if somebody told me don't do it and then i don't understand what comes up when it when it when it comes up and i'm like it's wrong because i feel this way and these are things i'm uh, i feel i'm thinking about a lot and just about the woman's body and how how you know you you also yani here i don't know yani i can't wear certain things but then when i do and i feel like it's not be, what is my purpose when i do that for yani how how do i what set how do i feel what attraction what can what energy am i am i feeling how am i how is that settling in my body what am i what's coming up why do i feel this these way yani giving myself the space to actually go through the process instead of saying that this is wrong and this is the only way because and then my friend commented she was saying you're making it hypersexualized but then i feel we are in a hypersexualized uh modern day society you know and maybe we go to pre back to primordial ways and maybe that's the right way but maybe also um think of touch a bit with more leniency not with such rigid yani rigid uh, no it's strong and then and then make people feel not 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 know how to deal with the sensations that may come up if you do interact with somebody in a certain way because you're just brainwashed to think that's how you're going to feel and that's wrong and that's it You're right in so many ways. Mm. Touch and compassion are so important, you know, and and it's just very sad to see it. Yeah, I mean, you have the heart's guidance. Yeah. I mean, um, definitely between the two extremes, uh, we must be watchful and careful because we are living in a time of spiritual degeneration. So people in the past, like an elderly person who would just, you know, tap somebody or even just a gentle hug was never sexual. But now we have older men who are like gawking <laughs> at women <laughs> younger or whatnot. And it's, they've made it because of their own spiritual degeneration. Not that the, the, the woman herself is the issue. It's never, it's usually not her. So for example, um, recently a friend of mine, um, nausea. Okay. Nausea. She basically, um, she, Initially, when I got to know her, she shared um, some spiritual guru, I forget his name now, and he was 
the guy who would vomit crystals and all the students were females. So when she talked about this person and his spiritual powers, and I was like, first of all, why is he, um, you know, is he leveraging through this sort of uh, ability he has or whatever it is, it could be a gimmick. Um, and certainly people are falling for it, thinking he's a divine human being or something like that. Um, like a very elevated guru. And it, there was something off about it because I think like 99.9% .9 of his students were females. And um, there was something just a little bit questionable. And then she recently sent me uh, so many, now there's like a lot of allegations against this person. It's not about talking about him because I don't even remember his name and I, I don't even know anything about him per se, but it's about just being careful because I think um, women in their own purity and naivety, um, because that's not what they're intending, but they may miss that picking up that energy field because they're not embodying it. So therefore they can't sometimes pick that up. And if we're not careful and have boundaries in our interactions, um, who disabled video? I never disabled it. Uh, let me just see. Give me a second, please. Uh, can you check uh, Mehtab to see that uh, videos for people have not been disabled? I'm not sure. Uh, I don't have access to the settings. Um, so... What I was saying here is that we must be careful as well, because just because we're not intending or we're not giving off that, we can't be too sure what's going on on the other side, right? And we're not here to speculate or to be like skeptics and, and, and doubt everyone and their intentions, but we should be careful because spiritual abuse is a reality. It happens. And if you see the higher guides, they have a very strong boundary with women, um, a very high level of adab and, and boundary. And they will redirect if you have a, um, like if you have like a question pertaining to something that uh, is very personal, they, they could, pro they mostly redirect you to a female authority, like, a, like somebody who's versed in fiqh, or maybe okay. a psychologist, or maybe a sheikha, you know, or something like that, maybe even a female healer, or some, something along these different lines of specialty, where it would be a redirection and say, you know, a lot of sheikhs, if they have a wife who is versed in certain things, it'd be like, you know what, just talk to our wife, you know, and uh, yeah, so, so that's, that's the thing. We have to be careful. And I agree with you, May. We shouldn't uh, hypersexualize everything. Like, I remember when I met Sheikh Munir, uh, just by the Green Dome, the first time I met him, he was taking dates, and he was just like, for Baraka, he bit it. And, you know, I would not be doing this if I felt something weird. But I did not feel that. I literally felt like that kind of um, fatherly type of sort of energy. And, and that's what I felt. And I took the date, for example. Um, but generally speaking, like I'm, I know I, I, I can pick that up usually. Yeah, I haven't had any, I haven't had that experience of, you know, spiritual abuse or whatever you want to call it that typically women go through because you have to have your graders on. You have to have your antennas up. Because that's, that's when we don't and we're not careful, then it's like disappointment because people you trust in the name of spirituality or religion can become a major disappointment. I have met many families, and this is like dark stuff. I've met many families in Saudi Arabia who said their Quran teachers have abused the children. Imagine yes, Quran Pakistan, teachers. Are so they are like cases. the devils of society, apparently. Yes. If I could get a hold of MBS and say, get them all on Khuruj, get them out of the country. 
I would do that. I swear I need to figure that out because I've heard of so many cases. They're all weirdos. So why are we letting our children like in a room shut, you know, th with some man who claims that he knows Quran, he doesn't live with his family, he probably has very a very suppressed situation and I don't know, they 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 turn towards perversion and in in the most subtlest ways. So why why is it that we uh, as parents, as guardians, as women we must have our guards on, right, Louisa? <laughs> I don't know what you've experienced in the ashram, but um, it's so sad because you can't do nothing about it because once your kids are older and they tell you, and all you can all you can do is just simply regret and say, why did I oversee that? Why did I trust that man? Because he claimed that he had the book of Allah memorized or he's a teacher of that. No, we're in a very spiritually degenerative time where the spiritual diseases are like crazy, you know. So we must be careful. You know, the, with the Kari Sabs, they're called Kari Sabs here, the one who teach you how to recite Quran. So there was this one uh, Kari Saab and, you know, he thought that, because I was young, he thought that I had a bubble gum in my mouth. I'm telling him I don't have a bubble gum in my mouth. So he put his finger in my mouth and I bit him so badly. <laughs> and then they ran out of the room. It was so bad. I'm laughing now, but... I, I think the parents so should bad. be put in jail. Because a lot of these cases, the parents have let the children or the daughter be alone with some man in a room and she's five years old. Yeah. Which is just, I don't understand. And yeah. But even my friends, they, one of my friends also relates and no, one of one, uh, my cousin and one of my friends, you know, they have issues with a home tutor and the other with the Kaisa, you know, and the brother is sitting right there, but they're of such young age, they don't know how to react to this holy person. So, so called holy. How could you even say holy? <laughs> yeah, so called so-called holy person can you repent stuff really it's animals they are yeah but because people parents uh there are two things that parents teach you at an early age that whatever some elder person asks you to come uh, that you ask you to just hug them you know you just go there hug them or or you know putting body people on the desk and you tell them that you know if you don't listen to elders you're committing sin these are the things that you know uh, make you hard to process and decipher between what's happening to them is either it's right or wrong like the good girl syndrome basically yeah yeah so but does this it, come it, from a lot more awareness on people <laughs> pleasing now Yeah, people pleasing and also like, have we lost uh, our ability to be intuitive or to to not be in sync with how our body feels? Um, I just opened my video because I was host, so I managed. Maybe we just pass the hosting around and everyone can open their video. I don't know, because I'm on my phone, so I can't... Um, find the settings right now where that could have been changed. 
but um but intuition i mean isn't that part of the thing it's like you get socialized into behaving a certain way and then you kind of forget what you intuitively feel like definitely if i look at um little Hafiz and he's definitely not caring about what other people think he follows his intuition very much and then you know people are going to tell him do this hug you know hug uncle hug auntie and then he you know slowly learns that his feelings are not as valid as pleasing others Yeah, it's it's uh, it's really uh, dangerous how we how you know the kid can be touched by anyone at any time without the kid being able to say no. Just even salam, you know, like going and k kissing people's cheeks or you know, and just doing that, doing that, and then you, yeah, yeah, it, it is. I went through it growing up. And then, and then that's when I wore the hijab. I felt like I wanted to have my space. I didn't want to to kiss the people I was so used to kissing while I was feeling like I couldn't really connect with my, uh, just have my space. And it really gave me the space to to not be touched and not be, um, it, it made me feel, uh, uh, yeah, like um, centered. Exactly. <clears throat> it's um yeah, so you know, not listening, our disconnect with our heart, um our body, our gut, right, is is basically, you know, um among the root causes of why. We have shut down listening to the inner voice. It doesn't feel right, doesn't seem right, but there's certain um, expectations of how we should behave, but we seem to, you know, overwrite that. And then that's when the trouble happens. Um, so it's, it's very important to kind of feel into everything that we're choosing and we're you know, every everything we're doing every day, feel into it, because then you you'll you'll truly be guided. So yeah, this is really really extending. It's becoming like a <laughs> super extended call and we're getting off now into another zone so how about we uh, stop the recording and if there's anything we need to say we can say it off the recording because <laughs> this is definitely like you know um well I'm the host All right